Really? Gotta go out? How's your sound work? I think my sound works. Sounds good. Okay, cool. I like, I like my headset. I, just, I don't have a loud voice, so these little microphones, I actually kind of like them. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to turn off my video. Now that we know what it works. No. Me too. Not until the meeting. Yeah.
Good morning. Morning. Where's my video? I can't find the video button. Oh, there it is. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We got three more people we're waiting for. It's like John, Dave, Brian. I can't wait to hear how much water we have in the reservoir. Oh my God, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got plenty. <laughs> More than enough. Everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Need to pipe it out west. I know. And this summer, the just that distribution's been just too much. Mm -hmm. Well, at least we're done for today, I think. I think mm -hmm. it's going to be nice the rest of today. Where's my phone? I got to look at the weather. Are we not getting anything from Nicholas? That was the I don't latest. Think so. Good. Yeah, we got as much from Ida, I guess it was, that you know we typically get in a whole month. That's kind of crazy. That's exciting. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Is everyone here? Yeah, we're still waiting for a few people. I think we should just wait for John and Brian and Dave supposedly coming. Here we are still Zooming. I'm so sick of this. <laughs> I'm actually okay with it. Yeah. I'm okay with it. It's this thing I, I just soon get rid of. What's yeah. the Oh, the mask, yeah. 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 Put it on every day so it's there. Mm. Otherwise, I end up someplace like, ah. Oops. Yeah, it's kind of like what two steps forward and one step back due to the delta.
There's Brian. I'm I'm headed to uh, to Boston after this meeting for my uh, father-in-law's internment and memorial service, and then tomorrow we have my sister-in-law's internment. Oh and Sunday, her memorial service. They both died nine months ago. Oh. Neither one from COVID. They both had long, happy lives. But uh, we have six siblings, their significant others, uh, five grandchildren, and at least two great grandchildren out of, I don't know, seven or eight, who uh, are all descending to um, celebrate the two lives. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the shock and the sadness are, you know, mostly mostly passed, but um, it's time to celebrate their lives. And we thought it would all be better. and We wouldn't need masks anymore. Not quite. Yeah. Not quite. It just, it just seems to keep dragging on. Yeah. This whole COVID thing, but. At least we're all vaccinated now. Yeah. That's good. And I feel like it's time people move on with things like that. You know, it's time we just got to keep going. Got to keep going. Do we have? Um, I think we're ready. I think and John. Oh, John is here. Good. Okay. Doctor. That's good. Um, Dave's the only one not on, but he told me he was going to come yesterday. But he's, you know, he's very busy, so he comes and goes. But um, hey, before so, you start, I, I got an address line. There he is. <clears throat> Lions, the uh, Norm McDonald, yes. there's a, okay. he passed recently, the, the comedian from SNL, and, yeah. and he had an interview with David Letterman, and he was saying, you know, he didn't want people to celebrate his life, uh, he, he when everybody could cry and <laughs> be sad and, and uh, uh, you know, grieve, it was a funny, funny skit. But, uh. <laughs> Don't you dare celebrate my life. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, welcome. And uh, here we are at our fall meeting of the Water Supply Protection Committee. Um, and yet we're Zooming again. We'll continue to Zoom until the town really decides that we can do these meetings in person. But we're just going to Zoom again. Um, and I think I'll just uh, get into it unless anybody has anything they want to talk about um, the first uh, the first item on the agenda is the water supply. Yep. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in just. We I was looking for we have texts that we're supposed to read at the start of every single meeting that says that a court I I don't have it in front oh, right. of me unfortunately I don't know if Dave might have it uh, but it basically says according to you know the governor's regulations with COVID we're allowed to meet um, via Zoom. Um, I wish I had the exact text, um, but I, you know, and also point out to everyone that this meeting is being recorded and, you know, so it will be available in the future. So just so that everyone's aware. So Dave, do you have the exact language on that that we're supposed to read in front of you? I don't, I didn't, uh, yeah, I didn't prepare. Sorry, Amy. Um, it's all good. I was trying I to didn't search. Prepare either. I, think, <laughs> I think, I think what you said is fine. I, good enough. Yeah. Okay. Just now you can jump yeah. in, Beth. Okay. <laughs> And yeah, I, I, I'm seeing that the recording is going, so we are recording. Um, okay, so the first agenda item is the water supply um, status. Um, and as we were just talking about, um, it's been an extremely wet summer. So uh, the drought is, is not an issue right now. Um, I'm gonna have, uh, ooh, what just happened? There we go. Um, Amy's going to talk a little bit about, so the drought's not an issue, um, and we will look at the reservoir levels and water um, use and all that data in a second, but 
Amy's also just going to mention that the town right now is in a situation where we may um, be needing to issue some conservation uh, language out to folks just because providing um, treated water at this point due to some of our infrastructure um, situations. If we have high demand this fall, the, um, the situation we may have a little trouble producing our treated water. But the, in terms of our water supply, um, there's plenty of water. So I will show you that data. Share my screen. All right, can you guys see my screen? Yep. All right, so this, this, so this comes right off of the um, water supply web page, um, and this is Atkins Reservoir levels through the end of August. Um, so as you can see, so the dark blue line is 2021. There's a point point in July when we were above the 15-year um, average right there. And here we are right now at the end of August and we're still uh, with plenty of water in the reservoir, close to the 15 year average, just a little bit below. Um, so that's that's all great. Um, and I just kind of wanted to point out, we added a little bit of language this year onto this chart that's in the webpage, um, just sort of explaining that certain years like 2020 and 2021, um, we were using the reservoir as more of a source than in other years, uh, simply because of the production decrease at well number four. So some, if people look at this um, just in terms of drought, uh, it's a managed water body as everybody knows. So it's not exactly a, a natural drought indicator. So we just wanted to note that on the chart for folks who go to the webpage. Um, and are looking at this and are thinking just straight out about drought. So, um, yeah, so that's where we're at with the reservoir. It's very full. Let's see. Going down on the web page, the water use by month. So, we're up in. We're up in August, which is typical. Students start coming back. Um, so we've definitely, use has definitely increased a bit. Um, we don't have our September data yet, but we're still below um, some of the previous, previous years, 2020, 2019, 10-year average. We're still a little bit below for um, water consumption. So that's good. And rainfall, no surprise, 2021 is the dark line. Um, highest ever in July. And now we're equal with 2018 approximately. Um, so again, very wet year. Can I make one comment about this, this graph? Absolutely. When it came up, my first thought was that the yellow line was 2020 because that's what the yellow line had been on the first graph mm, showing um, the reservoir levels it might be helpful to keep the color a year consistent yeah definitely i thought yep i thought we fixed that a little bit ago mm -hmm. let me let me just see what else yeah 2020 is orange Okay, yeah, I can go back and rearrange those colors again, make sure they all match. Um, so that's that. So that's still the web page that's up all the time for people to look at. And um, it basically, you know, provides some information, limited information, I guess, on our, our water supply right now. Um, but we're doing, doing fine in terms of any kind of drought situation. And so, Amy, do you want to talk a little bit about the situation um, with our infrastructure? 
or um, you guys might have actually seen um, a news article uh, recently about this, but um, you know, we, we've talked to, in a couple of our past meetings, we've talked about Centennial being offline, which um, we're in the process of, we did the pre-qualification process for contractors over the summer. Uh, we're hoping to bid the project sometime this fall. So we're nearing the end of uh, the design for the Centennial water treatment plant, but obviously that, um, that treatment facility is offline and not available right now. Um, and then the other thing that we've talked about in this group as well was the declining uh, capabilities of well number four, um, which is this project we've been talking about for about the last year um, and have been re-drilling a, well, drilling a replacement well next to well number four. Um, the, the challenge that we got was because of COVID, um, everything's just taking longer with that project. So while we thought that that would be up and online and connected to the system before the students came back, um, we're not there. Um, and really that's put us in a situation where we have enough water to meet an average day, but if we have higher than average day demand for multiple days in a row, the system would struggle to meet that demand. Um, and so, um, so we've communicated that that's, that's really the essence of the article. The article more made it sound like a water shortage drought related, um, but really the, the, the root of the problem is that well number four hasn't reached completion at this point and that Centennial is still in the works as well. So um, we did look pretty heavily at our past water usage in September. Obviously that's our largest month as Beth, Beth showed in that graph. Um, and we looked at a couple different variables just to see if there was anything that would help us predict when the higher usage would be, and it's pretty heavily tied to if it's above 85 degrees, you're more likely to have um, a higher usage day. We looked at what rainfall and um, temperature and day of the week and a couple other variables, and that temperature correlation was the strongest. And so right now, not only are we looking daily at the water usage, we're looking at the tank um, levels throughout the day as well, like really monitoring that closely, but we're also looking ahead to the weather um, and if we see a couple of days that might be above 85 degrees, um, then we're gonna preemptively send out messaging to the community to help them curtail their water usage. Because if we can stay below that average usage, um, we're okay. It's just, if we have multiple days that are above, you know, 3.4 um, or 3.5 MGD, that's where we're gonna um, struggle. Uh, thus far this month, I think our hottest day has been 82, so we're happy, um, and our average use has been about 2.9 MGD, so we've been doing well so far, but we, we're continuing to monitor it, so, yes. Amy? Yeah. Uh, so, I, I just... Oh. Who's first? <laughs> I don't know. I, I saw John's hand first, but either uh, okay. question is yeah. fine. <laughs> Anna, go uh, ahead. Okay. I just wanted to say that that I heard about this uh, sort of for the first time in a big uh, Amherst science chairs meeting. And I will say that the message was, I think, conveyed very accurately about what the issue was. Um, but of course, since it's Amherst College, we, we kind of like escalated to like, well, in worst case scenario, we may have to send all the students home. And I was like, what? I, like, I'm on a water board and but I guess we, we were doing like, if this happened and then this happened and then this happened, it could be that water just had to be shut off for a while. So is that true? <laughs> I, it's, it's funny because I have talked to several people at Amherst College. I know that their, <laughs> their level of concern is, is, I guess, higher than my level of concern for, you know, if that um, yeah. puts in perspective at all. Um, but, the only scenario where students would go home would be if we, you know, lost a major source for multiple days in a row and had hot days and had like a raging fire for, you know, that, I mean, it, it would take a lot of things. And so while I, I appreciate that they're thinking ahead so that if these disasters do happen, we're not scrambling to figure out the basics of water, we can instead deal with the major fire and the source being out and that sort of thing. But I think the likelihood of that is really low. Um, 
I say that during COVID where who could have imagined this scenario too. So, you know, so there is an element of um, thinking ahead that is certainly, you know, warranted, but and even we, like we, mo we actually modeled, <laughs> you know, another thing to add to that, we actually modeled the system. Um, if there was a water, major water main break, if there was a fire in town, and if a source went out, and um, at least during the first two scenarios, um, it, it's not it's not a huge impact. It's not a big enough impact that um, you know you think of a fire as a lot of water, but when you actually think of how much water it is compared to three and a half million gallons a day, it's you know a small amount. And the same thing with a water main break, um, it's it's a relatively small amount. If we were to lose a source obviously all the other sources would be pumping and so it would dampen the effect. So it's not like we wouldn't have any water, it's that we would be slowly losing pressure. So we'd have time to communicate out to people and to you know come up with the right approach as, as we're working the problem and as we're you know at least getting as much water going in. So it's, it's not, you're not gonna get a call immediately that says turn off all the water and send the students home but certainly you might only get a 24 hour heads up before we would start to get nervous about that if nobody can curtail their water usage, so. Amy, yeah. could you state, uh, describe the current sort of uh, production capacity of well number four for you know, multiple days in a row? Uh, how many MGD, uh, we used to, you know, we used to run it at 1.6 MGD, like, uh, you know, for parts of days or routinely, but right. what kind of number are we at at the moment for well number we, four? I, I don't have the number in MGD. I, I know in, in GPM. That's fine, divide um, by 694. Yeah, and so it's, okay. it's, it's able to give us about 150 GPM. No, uh, it's gotta be 50, 150 GPM? Yeah. Where that's it used to be like a thousand. Yeah, I mean, that's a quarter of an MGD. Yeah. And that's, you know, that that's the problem is that that gap. 150 from well four. Yeah. Wow. OK. Yeah. okay. The, I mean, this we think the screen got got clogged, but we tried redeveloping it and it didn't it didn't respond. And then the from there, the um, the amount yeah. that we're able to get out of it has been slowly decreasing yeah. over time. Do you feel you could push? Uh, Atkins to three trains to full, to full, you know, max peak hour capacity kind of thing, or you think it's one MGD? So Please. we've, we've tried that. We can get a little more than one MGD, but they tried the, they, they, they looked at doing three trains. Um, and it sounds like there's a couple hurdles, but one of the biggest hurdles is that all of the SCADA programming, because it never ran with three trains, all the SCADA programming uh, you know, assumes two trains and divides the number by two and doesn't allow you to divide the number by three, yeah. which sounds yeah. like such a simple problem. But when you have so, so much complicated- I know it isn't. Yeah, yeah know. it's it's yeah. actually a really, it would take a lot, a lot <laughs> to reprogram it okay. to, you know, have that input be able to be three. And the guys are so nervous sure. that something would get missed and then we wouldn't have Atkins at all. And so, um, this is one of those, you know, had we known about it a year ago, we could have been working at trying to do that. But right now, um, right now, it's it's a little more complicated than that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Amy, yeah. Can you just really briefly, can you tell us what two trains, three trains means? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So at, at, at um, Atkins, it has basically three parallel treatment trains. So, yeah. And um and this is gonna be the same up at Centennial as well. And so the water, typically we use two trains and then one train is always offline, um, either being rehabbed or just kind of ready to go. Um, and it's never really been operated with all three. Um, in, so. in engineering parlance, it's an N plus one design. You, you design for N trains operating and you have one ready to, to go for lots of things. So in each of the trains have been about a half MGD, 350 gallons per minute. So right. the design capacity or normal capacity is one MGD at Atkins, it was at Centennial, but there are three trains sitting there. So theoretically, right, right. but there's there's the notion and then there's operations. So understood. <laughs> and I didn't realize well forward capacity had dropped. So, so yeah. Much. 
not from the water's perspective, from the mechanical's perspective, yeah. from getting the water out of the ground. Getting the water out of the ground at that yeah. site. Yeah. So. yeah. Ah, the subsurface. <laughs> Any other questions or thoughts on this? Yeah, Chris. Uh, I guess just what is um, the timeline for, you know, uh, I don't know what the right word is, fixing this situation, <laughs> I don't know if that's right. the right word, but just kind of like, how is this, you know, months or years or, you know, like wh where are we? And so how long are we gonna be keeping an eye on this? And yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. So, um, we're most concerned about getting through the month of September because September is the highest uh, water usage. If you look at the past like five years, taking out 2020 when the students weren't here, but you look at the last five years before that, and every year there was in September, there was maybe half a dozen to 10 days during the month that you would get usage above that, you know, 3.3, 3.4 that we know that we can comfortably provide for days on end. Um, it, when you look at October, there's maybe one or two random days and never two days in a row. And so our immediate concern is obviously getting through September so that the usage drops a little bit. Now, obviously until well four is fixed and online, we're still gonna need to be aware that the loss of a source you know, a major fire, a water main break, those sorts of things may stress us out a little bit. So we're going to have to continue to watch it, but we're a little less concerned because, you know, as you know, if it's really kind of the, the day after day high usage that would, you know, deplete the system rather than allow us to recover. And that's, that's where the biggest um, area of concern is. I think so. The question was, when will well number four be done? That, yes. What's the prediction? Uh, Beth, do you want to jump in on that one? I'm um, sure. I mean, that's what's next on our agenda. Um, great segue, Beth. Yeah, great segue. <laughs> These topics, they all go together. I thought that was the agenda. <laughs> um, so, well, number four, at this point, we are uh, waiting for the, the pump and the motor, which have been ordered. Um, and that is uh, <coughs> our, our drilling company is, is ordering that. So the, the, the well is installed. Um, it's been developed. We sampled it. We, we sampled it for PFOS, which we can talk about a little bit later on the agenda. But we, we did a full round of sampling and everything came back fine. So it's been developed. It's been sampled. And right now we're just waiting for, again, some of the infrastructure. And there's been delays with well number four, like the screen, which is now in, but the screen took much longer than we anticipated or anybody did. And that's all COVID related. And I, I, I'm not sure about the motor and the pump, but I'm assuming it could be a similar scenario that because of all the manufacturing delays with COVID, um, those things are being a bit delayed too. So that's where we're at with that. Um, Again, a time frame. I would say I would hope that those parts would be in in the next month, um, and then uh, those need to be put in, um, and then we need to connect it to the main, which we also have ordered. The town has ordered uh, materials for that. So that's that's our goal. Would you say that's about right, Amy? Yeah, Jason? I think. I mean, I. We're, we're optimistically hoping, you know, end of October, early November, that this will be, you know, in and online. Although at this point, we haven't heard from um, the pump and motor manufacturer, like a firm date to know if that's realistic or if that's not. Um, and then it's a matter of the driller fitting it in the schedule to come and install it. And so, you know, it's... Yeah. We're yeah. a couple of points are a little in the air and, and we're not going to know how much COVID slows that down. So. Yeah. I mean, I guess hope would yeah. be that the materials come within a month and then the actual installation and all the work possibly happens over the next month. Um, yeah. That would be the optimal, I guess. So anybody have any more questions on that? No. Okay. Um, so Moving through the agenda next is the water line extension project in Leverett, which I don't know, Jason, do you want to update everybody on that? Uh, there we go. All right, can you hear me? Um, yeah, so that's going really well. Um, 
Baltazar is the contractor. They've put in over a mile of pipe already. I, th I think they're closing out on like 5,000 feet this week. Um, and that was probably three weeks worth of work. Um, so they, they really hustle. They've gotten all the water made. They're over the town line right now uh, and turning the corner from East Leverett Road, Cushman Road onto T. Waddle Hill Road and beginning the final stretch um, to feed the five or six houses in Leverett that need uh, treated water. So that once they get the main in, they'll hop back and do uh, services. And they also have to do hydrants, which have been a supply chain issue. Um, we expect, we've heard that they're coming in mid-September, but it is mid-September. So we're, we should, we either expect to have them delivered or expect excuses on why we don't have hydrants yet, but they're coming. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're moving right up very fast. The two obstacles right now are drilling under the two bridges. We've got um, JS Ray out there uh, boring the water main under uh, the, the river and they, they're having a heck of a time. They said it's the hardest rock they've ever encountered. Um, so uh, they're struggling, but they're slowly moving forward. They've had to get new drill bits. They've had similar supply chain issues with getting a new drill bit and breaking their old drill bit. And yeah, so, but they are slowly boring under the, the river right now and, and hope to be done within a couple of weeks. So once they get under the river, Baltazar can connect all the different pieces of Maine and, and uh, move on from there. That's everything. Anybody have questions about the Leverett water main line? Jason, could you just remind us of, of the size and the material for the main? Oh, we went with uh, 12 inch ductile iron. Um, we put an alternative for plastic uh, PVC water main and uh, it came in a uh, negligible price difference. Again, I think because of supply chain issues. Um, but yeah, the, the cost difference was negligible, even though the material cost is for ductile versus plastic is huge. Um, the installation price was not very different. So we chose to go with ductile. It is uh, the, the two sections that are getting bored is, are going to be uh, fused HDPE. But that's, right. yeah, that's just for the boring purposes. In which case, the boring, Jason, you were referring to, that's that's underneath the bridge uh, on East Leverett Road, by upstream offers? Correct. Yep. Okay. And what's the other boring location? Uh, it's the same brook, but it's on T. Waddle Hill Road. There's one house on the other side of the river. Uh, we're only doing a two inch under that river um, to get to the final house that needs treated water. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that project's moving along. Yeah, we've had weekly job progress meetings and they think they've got less than five weeks worth of the work left. So That's great. They, they're a well-oiled machine. It's, it's kind of scary to stand in the construction zone because you've got equipment moving on all sides of you. Um, and and everybody, nobody needs to be told what to do. They just, everybody's doing their job you know, laying pipe, digging holes, compacting, backfilling. It's just, it's, it's fun to watch actually. <laughs> um, That's good. So this, this semester, uh, a faculty member, his name is Nick Tucker, Professor Nick Tucker is teaching both our freshmen and the senior design class that I taught forever and ever and ever called Water Supply and Waste Water Collection. So he, if he hasn't, he'll be interacting with you about some I know he's been taking pictures of the project uh, so that we can teach our students. It's a great learning opportunity to have these field sites to go to for pipe pipe installation and stuff like that. So I know Nick will be. Yeah, yeah. He's, been, he's been reaching out to Jimmy Jordan, who's the engineer kind of overseeing this project. And I think he's come up and taken a bunch of video and that yeah. sort of thing. So. Yeah. Nick worked at, uh, worked, uh, maybe I don't know if you ever overlapped with Amy or uh, at all, but Nick. Uh, yep. Worked with Time Bond for a number of years and then went, did a PhD at Northeastern and is in his third year of uh, being a professor, or fourth year, starting his fourth year of being a 
professor here at UMass, a, le a lecturer. <sighs> He's uh, really, really excellent. All right, great. Um, our next project, our next infrastructure project is uh, the Centennial Water Treatment Plant. Um, and I think, Amy, can you talk about that too? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I covered a lot of that during um, earlier talking about the, you know, water supply status. But, um, you know, like I said, we're, we, we went through the pre-qualification process um, over the summer to have all of those ready. Um, they're nearing completion of design. Um, I think we actually go to the Pelham um, planning board next Monday. Um, so there, I mean, there's, we're kind of going through the last bits of permitting for that project, the last bit, which are going to just inform the last, you know, five or 10% of the design. Um, and then we're hoping to be bidding sometime this fall. So I don't know if anyone has any Great. questions or additional thoughts on that. Estimate of completion yeah. for production, year and a half, two? Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, if there's no more questions on that, we can move on. Uh, next on the agenda is the PFAS sampling that we did this year. Um, I know I sent out a couple emails to all of you when we got the results back, but we did sample in both April and July at five of our points of entry. So all of our points of um, entry to the distribution system. Um, and we got nothing above the laboratory reporting limit, um, which is great. The laboratory reporting limit has been two parts per trillion. Um, currently, I'm not sure you know what DEP is going to do in the future with that, but that's where it's at right now. And we haven't had anything <clears throat> excuse me, above that. So those two sampling rounds we did at our points of entry, and those were required um, by DEP with their new PFAS regulations. Um, we also were required to sample the uh, well number four when we were when we were developing. So this is the replacement well number four, which as you we just talked about isn't online yet, but the um, part of the regulations for uh, putting in a new replacement well is that you have to do a 48 hour um, pump test and then you have to sample for a variety of um, parameters and one of the new ones is PFOS. Um, so we sampled there too, and similar to our points of entry. So the, you know, the points of entry are obviously after somewhat treatment, at, specifically at the water treatment plants. Um, the well number four, replacement well number four, was more of a raw sample, and we also got nothing above uh, the reporting limit of two parts per trillion. So Amherst is looking pretty good for with PFOS, which is which is really great considering we've talked about this a lot. John will probably talk about it more in a bit, but um, there's so many towns across Massachusetts that are, that are running into this problem and it's becoming such an expensive and technical problem for a lot of towns across the Commonwealth. Um, so what else did I wanna say about that? I think I think that's all I wanted to say about that. Um, if anybody has any questions, Brian? Um, uh, one thing I just want to let folks know, I'm taking notes. I don't we used to always assign a note taker. Yeah, today I assigned myself. But um, the other thing that's is- great. Sure, um, Beth, <laughs> you, um, you're saying reporting limit. Do you mean detection limit or are those the same? No, laboratories, so there's a, there's, there's a detection limit that really is what their um, machinery, their lab, machines can actually detect to. And then there's a reporting limit, which I always think of it as um, where a lab is absolutely confident that whatever's being detected right. is not coming, isn't coming from their equipment, for example. So they, they set, and that's for all parameters for anything that gets analyzed at a lab, you have sort of a detection limit, but then you have a reporting, reporting limit. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's just standard lab results that you'll get back that you may get something that gets sort of flagged as a very low concentration, but the lab is not confident that that's not coming just from something having to do with, with them. So reporting limits are really the legal regulatory 
limit that you look at. So, and two parts per trillion is pretty low. Um, so as part of the project that we're implementing for DP, actually, I don't wanna tell you how many hours and how many people are doing QC for every PFAS sample collected, for every PWS, every private well goes through a, a process of our, the team, the DP, DP doesn't have the inside capability to do this. So uh, completely, so, I mean, it's with DEP, but there's a lot of behind the scenes work, a lot of reconfirmation, a lot of sometimes samples rejected uh, and redone just based on protocol. And there's a really a intense amount of scrutiny, both for PFAS 6, the regulated end for the full range of uh, PFAS, uh, it's either 18 or 14 in the current method being used. Because um, occasionally we have a significant level of something that's not PFAS 6, but one of one of the other occasional uh, compounds that, that pops. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of QC behind all that, getting to that MRL, <laughs> MDL, what it is for different compounds, how it's reported, do you add this? The, the amount of discussion is intense. <clears throat> so, but yes, that's why I wrote in reply to Beth that uh, we really have to feel very, very fortunate to to be in this uh, non-detect world. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of non-detects, okay? It's not, it's not like it's few, but there's plenty of, plenty of issues too. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, Jack? question. So I, I, we probably would expect these results because we don't really have a lot of industry in town or, or near industrial towns. <laughs> the only thing I was thinking is a fire training at Amherst Fire Department, you know, did they ever use these foams fire suppressive foams and if they did, you know, where, but obviously it's far away from, you know, all our sampling points. Yeah, I mean, if you look, to me, if you look at the history of how Amherst developed its, its, its water supply and where they, where they chose to put our wells and also the preservation of the um, watershed since, you know, going back to the 1940s. I mean, they, it was really planned well, I think, and mm -hmm. we're we're benefiting from that. You know, I don't know, Amy. Do you know anything about the foams from the fire department? <laughs> um, I I I can only speak from my experience that you know the the foams were used, and when we tested them out, it was uh, at beyond behind the north station. I forget what that is, but that road down at the end of the road. There's that old. I think it's the old power plant. So um, there's a bunch of land back there, which you know, fortunately, isn't near any of our um, active sources, um, or isn't uphill of any of our active sources, at least. But um, yeah, I don't know of other places in town. But you know, we are fortunate that we don't have industry or you know a firefighting academy or an airport or you know a lot of these other. Um, things that are kind of typical. That being said, it's being found in other communities as well. And so, you know, it's, it's good that we sampled, but we're certainly glad that, um, like Beth said, they, they did a great job protecting the watershed from an early, early time period. Our, you know, the program, you may be aware also, we have uh, trying to get thousands of private well samples done. We're, we're into, to, to, many hundreds. And uh, the toughest part about that is calling a, a private well owner about a, a limit over over either a limit or recent, we had some over uh, a very high limit that, that instantly invokes bureau wayside cleanup and stuff like that. And that's um, that's a tough, we have a staff member who's making those phone calls and that's that's tough to, uh, to do that. And a bunch of those on the source side are not very clear. Uh, really, really, really hard to figure out. Um, just sometimes it's sort of obvious, like they shared the well with the fire station and there was a, F, a triple F use and stuff like that is obvious. Other times, not so clear. So mm -hmm. a lot of hit and the town of Carlisle is having a, having a rough go and other places. So it's an evolving story. That's, uh, that's what I want to say, but. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it's gonna change as, as time keeps going. Mm. Um, one other thing I, I just wanted to say about it, we did apply a DEP 
allows communities who have gotten two rounds during, so this is mandatory quarterly sampling that we've been doing. And if you have two rounds that have, they're all non-detect, you can apply for a waiver to not have to continue with the quarterly sampling. So we did apply for the waiver. Um, that being said, that doesn't mean that we obviously won't sample again for PFAS, but it would just be a different schedule. We wouldn't be necessarily doing it that often, but we will find out from DEP exactly how often they're gonna want us to continue to, to sample our points of entry. But that was a good thing too, because the, the um, analysis is a bit expensive. So to not have to be doing it quarterly um, for the town was good. Um, By the way, DEP got a EPA Regional One award for, for the program. Uh, oh, wow. It's the DEP drinking water program. And by extension, the, the whole team of other people who are involved, but not, not named explicitly, but um, then it wouldn't happen without <laughs> the, the, the project at UMass. So. <laughs> Yay, UMass. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a weird thing to do, but I know we're doing it. <laughs> it would, I, we we benefited from the free sampling round in April. I, that you was got great. your first one free, yeah. We're, that was we're great. We're waiting for a big explosion here for October because all the smaller systems are supposed to sample, but it's it's just not happening yet. We'll see. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that keeps uh, communicating, saying, "Hey, by the way, <laughs> you can get a free sample. You got to uh, sample in October. Why don't you do it?" <sighs> all right. Well, um, Lyons uh, wanted to talk about some work he's been doing with um, with rainwater. And PFOS. So I have uh, volunteered to be a rainwater collection station to operate a rainwater collection station for a uh, statewide study being done uh, through the LSP community. Um, and we'll be collecting two rainwater samples um, in my backyard and uh, a collection of uh, other LSPs across the state um, and their employees are doing similar sampling uh, at their, at their. Uh oh. Uh oh. Lines, I think you're. Um, Got the big freeze. You're, yeah, you froze up. <laughs> their residences and we oh, will be we putting that together. So am I back now? Yes. You are back now. Okay. Yes. Anyway, uh, my understanding is there's somewhere around 200 collection stations uh, across the state. And um, I just got my sampling kit yesterday, not in time to sample last night, um, but we'll be sampling soon in the next couple of weeks. And by the time we have our our next meeting, um, I should have uh, results. Lines, can you describe the motivation, uh, the lab that's being used, and uh, et cetera, a little bit about why this is happening? The motivation is to help determine whether rainwater is a source of PFAS in certain areas of the state or not. Um, the lab that's being used is Alpha Analytical. Um, the study's being run by Duff Collins out of um, Woodard and Curran. Um, and their employees and other LSPs across the state. Great. I assume the device, a lot of attention to the device you're using to collect because uh, it's a super easy sample to contaminate. It yes. Like, yeah. It's got a, it's got a rainwater collection tray. Um, I don't know, it's still in nice. the box. It just arrived yesterday afternoon, so. Teflon lined, don't worry about it. What? <laughs> I said lined with Teflon, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> don't you? So, and we'll spray it with WD-40 so nothing sticks to it. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. So this is rainwater, not storm water. This is rainwater. Direct precipitation. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Direct and precipitation hasn't touched anything ground. but the tray. I don't know if people are aware of the, the, the 
subsurface contamination in New Hampshire from a manufacturing facility that rain rain was the the mechanism attributed to 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 causing that. So it's 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 a good excellent question to be asking. Yeah. All right. Any more questions about PFOS? No. Thanks. If you if you nope. get a chance, uh, if they whenever they put out the map of sampling locations, it'd be interesting to see. The, I think you said two hundred sites or so. It'd be great to see where they are. Yes, it would be. <laughs> be very interesting to see where they are. Um, <laughs> the LSP community did a similar thing with indoor air contamination. Uh, I don't know about ten years ago, maybe a little more, um, where they reached out to uh, folks and had them sample the air in their houses because there was no such thing as a background indoor air number for a long list of volatile contaminants. So uh, LSPs are like, well, we need this number. Oh, well, why don't we design a study and collect the data? So I don't know about that sampling strategy of asking environmental professionals to test for indoor environments. <laughs> I hope they're a little more conscious than the general public. I don't think so. <laughs> Based on the study, I... <laughs> hmm. well, we'll see what the PFAS results since it's like, yes. you know, yes. as John was saying, it's you have to be pretty careful with how you collect your sample. Yeah. Exactly. Is um, lines are you seeing a lot of uh, LSP BW Bureau of site cleanup uh, interaction due to, I mean. We're finding these things, Bureau of Site Cleanup takes it over, and I assume then there's subsequent interaction with LSPs to deal with sites. Um, I'm not working on any that have uh, PFAS issues at the moment. Okay. Um, I've worked on uh, a dozen or more I can think of that if, if we went back, uh, people <laughs> would be asking that question and we would have sampled, but yeah. we didn't know at the time. Right. Mm -hmm. right. No, Jack? I'm not really working on it. How about Jack? Jack yeah, I was going to say, um, I have one site, but it's a New Hampshire site, but the source is in Massachusetts. Um, <laughs> ah, you should make commerce. <laughs> but Massachusetts had, um, didn't make us chase it. It was New Hampshire that was, you know, kind of leveraging their hazardous waste sites to require consultants to do, you know, expanded sampling just to, you know, for their database. And uh, we had a sample because it was a dry cleaning solvent. So it was associated with the, um, the uh, what's that, that spray that you would use, uh, Ray something, um, that the water repellent spray, I can't think of the name right now. But anyway, there's some association with dry cleaners and, and, and we found some, but it was just like all over the place, not consistent because you know how PFAS holds, has all these, um, you know, species to it and they're, they're not related necessarily. And we found some in, you know, some private wells down gradient and, but we just really couldn't attribute it, you know, to the dry, to the release that we were working on, but it's, uh, uh, but, you know, I don't think MassDP has, uh, you know, required LSPs, if you have this type of contaminant, go ahead and sample for PFAS because you want you to have, it. you're not aware of that either, Lions, right? No. Yeah. So I don't sample for it. <laughs> it no, absolutely it's like, have to. But... It's, like, it's like everything else. If you, if you have a potential source, then you need to sample. But if you don't have a, a known potential source, yeah. you're not going to go looking for problems. Yeah. Um, exactly. How long has New Hampshire been requiring that for hazardous waste sites or certain uh, hazardous waste sites? That program initiated uh, was initiated again where where John was saying with that atmos that classic study uh, is a um, Saint Gobain or something like that. Um, you know that a New Hampshire site, and it's just clear that you know prevailing winds. There's a plume of atmospheric deposition down gradient of where the factory was. With, that had the stacks, um, but so but they, they started maybe five years ago, I think. Oh, wow. Yeah, and yeah, so, but New Hampshire is very busy. They're, they're, they're 
putting a lot of people on public water utilizing the MTB -E, uh, monies that they won in a case against Exxon Mobil with the MTBE. So they're using the money for water lines up there and, and uh, kind of taking care of, you know, a couple of problems at the same time with the PFAS and the MTBE. Interesting. Um, all right. Um, if nobody has anything else uh, that they want to say or or ask about the PFAS, um, we can move on. Next on our agenda is the Lawrence Swamp spring sampling results. Um, so we have these few wells down in Lawrence Swamp that we uh, monitoring wells that we sample in the spring and the fall, and we did sample uh, last May. We sampled uh, six six monitoring wells in one surface location, which I think is what people have always done in the past. Um, so let me share my screen as I share you show you a quick graph. Pretty simple graph. <laughs> um, so we've been doing this sampling for quite a while. I just started the graph at 2010, but the, the sampling goes way back into um, the early 2000s. But um, so this is just showing three of the locations that we sampled because uh, these are located near major roads and they're also shallow monitoring wells. So they're just good to look at in terms of salts. And so we're analyzing for chloride. Um, and one monitoring well 189 just consistently tends to be a little bit higher. Um, that's off of Southeast Street. The other two are off of Holst Road. Um, so I think one, 189, um, it's, it's located sort of at a lower grade from the road. So I think it takes a little more drainage than these other two do. Um, so it does have a little bit of salt showing up in it. Um, and that's all I want to show for that. So let me stop sharing. Um, and yeah, so those wells are all down in Lawrence Swamp. Um, and that particular group we we look at for road salt. Um, and some of the some of the they're downgrading of the landfill too. So we're looking at some some things with that too. Um, that's all I wanted to say with that. Let me know if anybody has any questions on that. Are, have any of the wells downgrading of the landfill been sampled for PFAS? No, not yet. We haven't been asked for that yet. <laughs> yeah, don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> we don't have look. our, yeah, we, we do, and we have an annual, uh, we have a, monitoring or environmental program for the landfills, you probably all know, and we, we sample annually at 40, 40 different locations, and that's coming up this October, and it's it's wells and surface water locations, um, and no, we the, the last thing we added to that list was one for dioxane, um, so we will see when PFAS gets added. Um, next thing on the agenda is watershed projects. Um, and what's been been going on in the watershed just in the last uh, six months, I guess we had Atkins Dam inspections. Uh, so these are the required phase one inspections. Atkins was inspected about a year ago and Hill and Holly and intake um, were just inspected last week. Um, Atkins, the, so time bond is who we've, we've had to do this um, for a while. And the results from last year's um, inspection showed, I guess it gave, it gave the dam a, f a rating of fair, which is pretty good. There is some um, embankment seepage, which actually showed up at the, the inspection in 2018 also. So Atkins is inspected every two years. The other three dams have a, have a much more spread out inspection schedule because they're not rated as as basically as dangerous, but so Atkins is is a high uh, monitored dam, and so there's a there's an embankment seepage, and the recommendation <laughs> from Time Bond was to 
um, do some kind of an evaluation program, um, putting in a weir to measure sort of the outflow that's coming, that, that measure the seepage, try to measure it, um, maybe monitoring wells, maybe ground penetra penetrating radar of the dam itself to get a look at what's going on in the dam structure-wise. Um, so all of that is on our radar and is something we'd like to apply for a, a grant, um, hopefully, possibly this year, even to start looking at. Um, so, but besides that, besides that, the embankment seepage, the other recommendations from the phase one were, were minor things like vegetation, mowing, tree removal, in you know, areas that maybe some roots are getting into the abutments and things like that. Um, so we got a fair, which is pretty good. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions about the dam inspections, Brian? Yeah, do, do they inspect the dike at the, <clears throat> the south end of Atkins? At Atkins, um, that was not part of this inspection. I think that is on a, at a different rotating schedule. So we haven't done yeah, that. Yeah, it's, camp. it's, they, they rated all, I mean, Beth explained this a little bit. They rated all of the, um, you know, dams and dikes and all of that. And based on if they're high hazard or medium hazard or low hazard, they're on different schedules. And so the dike is one that gets um, regularly inspected, but not as often as the Atkins because it, you know, it's not as tall and um, we don't have as much critical infrastructure below it or houses or people that could be, you know, harmed in the process. So it's, it's just inspected a little less frequently. Mm -hmm. Yep, less hazardous. Is is part of the reporting done by the consultants now um, thinking about the the likelihood of a, a more frequent and more extreme events that can lead to, you know, that's the stressors on dams is extreme events. So, um, you know, I assume that's sort yeah. of now routinely part of uh, the evaluation that people make. At least I hope it is. Yeah, I, it, yeah, it is. There's there's some discussion of of climate change and and changes in um, storage and and storm events and everything in time bonds reporting and their that evaluation. It, I mean, the geography leading to the what the watershed for that reservoir is not of the sort that it's not like a ravine topography or something like that. But so that's favorable, but still yeah, good. Yeah. Yep. I think it's worth thinking about because there's there is no uh, engineered spillway for Atkins. There's only one way for water to get out of Atkins Reservoir through, the, through, the, through those two or three trains. I understand. Yeah, right. There is control of water going in, um, you know, in, in, in at one location. <laughs> but yeah. So hopefully. Yeah. Sorry, oh, no, I was just going to add that, like, um, kind of dovetailing with this effort, you know, the town is also through, um, you know, Stephanie Ciccarello and the, you know, sustainability coordinator, she, she's doing efforts with the whole town on um, climate change and kind of looking at, you know, flooding and stressors and that sort of thing. And so I, I know they've, they're just kind of scratching the surface of that, but they are looking at, you know, the water supply as one of the, you um, infrastructure, you know, critical infrastructures that they're, you know, reviewing as they start to dig into um, climate change and how it would affect the town and then how we can prepare um, for those sorts of things. So again, like it's, that's, that's in an early phase, but it's, it's the, you know, the town in general is looking at that as well. Mm -hmm. See, seem to get these intense cells local that, I mean, the infrastructure damage in South Eastern New Hampshire in some places this past on some storms, the, you know, in in and I uh, I know the Springfield Water and Sewer Commission, Cobble Mountain Reservoir got seven inches of rain one day on on Reed. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. so there's there's just seems more infrequent more frequent localized intense events that mm -hmm. will cause infrastructure damage. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and no, I, you know, I know Time Bond, and when they're doing these inspections, is that's in their thought process, it's in their reports, and 
I would assume even DCR, which is sort of the regulator for the, for all these for the dams, would um, also be considering all that and maybe you know increasing requirements. I don't you know I don't know, but you'd hope it's all on everybody's minds. Um. All right. So yeah. So those those are all. That's all the major topics on the agenda. Um, if anybody has anything else they want to say, that's great. We can also set a date for our next meeting. And Brian, just so you know, we are recording to um, for doing the minutes, but any notes you're taking, that's great. All right, well, I was thinking Thursday, January 20th, it's the third Thursday um, of the month of January, we seem to be sticking with the third Thursday works for everybody. Is that good? Okay. Good. Great. Could we change it to the second or fourth Thursday? I have another set of meetings that that happen on third Thursdays of the month. Okay. I'm fine with Thursday, that. Thursday is a good day. I just wondering if folks would be Go with the fourth one. Fine with me, too. I would vote for the fourth one versus the second. All right. Does anybody have a problem with January 27th? No. Okay. Awesome. Great. Thank you all. Appreciate all right. that. No problem. Um, and that's all I have. Does anybody have anything else? I just want to make two comments. One is about PFAS and the private wells. I mentioned some things. Uh, the, the selection of wells, it's it's the 83 communities that are 60% or more served by private wells for drinking water. Those are the communities, it's about 83 or 84. And the well selection process, it, it is targeted. We're trying to find, you know, there's information taken in and try, it's random, but also a group of wells where we're looking for things that might be. So it, it we might have a higher incidence. Um, while I'm mentioning things, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of non-detects also. <laughs> uh, I do want to mention that, it, you know, we're not talking about a majority thing here, but the fact that it is there is a concern, um, just to mention that. And you you should, on that subject, you know, if you just Google MassDEP uh, PFAS, there's a great uh, page with a story, with a map. Story map is a popular thing these days, uh, populating things, showing maps of stuff. So um, there's a lot of behind the scenes GIS work also by students and others producing those that information for DEP. So there's a lot of great information there. Um, there's also going to be one I want to mention and continue working in the lead in school and child care facilities. We, we've got resources where our struggle is to get child care providers to sign up. Uh, this this life is many, many things on their agenda, much higher than doing sampling of for lead in their water. <laughs> Uh, you can only imagine, uh, right? That's a low priority. So we're hoping to get them uh, get them engaged. And we have an opportunity to leverage uh, the upcoming revised lead and copper rule, which requires some more sampling at schools and child care facilities, which puts an onus on public water suppliers that I imagine public water suppliers are have concerns with, <laughs> uh, I'm sure. Uh, Amy could speak about that, but um, uh, hopefully, this program can do some help to team with public water suppliers to help with that. Uh, we're trying to get some EPA to agree that we could spend some money now to get some data that can be used for regulation that will be in effect down the road. But we'll see if we if EPA goes along with that. So anyway, that um, issue is still there. <clears throat> I have a, John, one question. So mm. I live in Shutesbury, which is one of the 83 communities mm. with more than 90% on mm. private wells. And, and so I applied for the 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 sampling, the free sampling, and was told that I, that there was other priorities. <laughs> there are other areas apparently of the town. So um, is that, that's common. And should I apply again? Or or if I, if I'm in an area where they no. decided there's not any, then I shouldn't yeah. even. So apply. we got dollars and politics and other things. So we got 40 samples per those communities, roughly. And mm -hmm. we frequently have many more people sign up. For some communities, some communities right. it's the other way around. But Shrewsbury was one where there's more people uh, uh, vo uh, uh, signing up uh, than and and in there that we then could be accommodated. Yeah. So yeah, no, you're in you're in the queue. You're there. You're known about, yeah. but it yeah, may not happen. Yeah. 
Yeah, but it doesn't necessarily mean that my particular neighborhood doesn't have it. That's why I wasn't chosen. It's more just based on uh, numbers. Yeah, there's a multiple group of factors that could go in there. And and in, okay. in fact, it's a ran there's a random part of it as well. It's, it's a com combination of random for coverage and targeted. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks for taking notes, Thanks. Brian. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. Brian gave a great seminar on erosion yesterday in the Northeast Climate Science Adaptation Center. So that was nice to listen to then, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah. For those of you who missed it, it's online. So yes. <laughs> you can actually see Brian. If you missed the talk, it's on the, the UMass website. So, mm. right. or it will be. Good, good. Great. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thank you.